Good evening, everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. We're so excited to have many of you here with us today. Now, my name is Haban Ali, and I'm an urban planner with Sidewalk Labs. And my name is Aaron Barter, and I'm on the sustainability team at Waterfront Toronto, and together we are your co-hosts for tonight's roundtable. Uh, Haban and I are also both, also, also both from Toronto, and as Torontonians, uh, we're super excited to kind of walk through some of the innovations that could have a huge positive impact on our city. But before we get started and explain our plan for this evening, I want to start by recognizing that we're here tonight as treaty people, bound by covenant and to one another. Whether our ancestors have deep roots here or we've recently arrived, now all of us have an obligation to care for one another and for this territory. And that's why we start by recognizing the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and reminding ourselves of our obligations. Thank you, Haban. Before we get into our presentation uh, and talk about streets, public realm, and buildings, uh, I would first like to introduce Meg Davis, our Chief Development Officer at Waterfront Toronto, who will be sharing a few updates off the top um, from Waterfront Toronto. Welcome, Meg. Thanks, Aaron and Haban, for that warm welcome. And welcome, everybody. Um, it's terrific to see so many people here, some familiar faces, some new faces. Um, it's great to see the amount of excitement. We know you've had a lot of questions over the past little while. We hope to answer a lot of those tonight. I'd like to talk to you about two things. First of all, Waterfront Toronto's role um, as the steward for waterfront revitalization and our relationship with Sidewalk Labs, and also to put Keysight in context of the overall waterfront revitalization project. So as you know, many of you know, for the past decade, Waterfront Toronto has been the revitalization lead um, for wa Toronto's waterfront. As the um, public agency of all three levels of government, uh, we are uh, uniquely positioned to deliver on the public interest mandate in stewarding the revitalization of our waterfront. And our mandate is very unique through our legislation. We are uh, enacted to enhance the economic, cultural, and social value of the lands in the designated waterfront area. We're here to create accessible, thriving communities, but do so in a fiscally and environmentally responsible manner. To promote and encourage private sector inv um, investment to help us deliver on the waterfront mandate. And to encourage public input without which we couldn't do our work. All of this to create new economic growth, jobs, new commercial, residential, and retail spaces, new cultural institutions that you've already seen started on the waterfront with GBC, new parks, public spaces, and public realm. So back as far as 2001, um, our first board chair, Robert Fung, said Waterfront Toronto could be the world's portal to the new knowledge economy. And at the time, that was quite leading edge wanted to create a waterfront for the people by creating vibrant spaces to live and to work. But to also be, as a public agency, to, to get and thrive off of all of the public input that helped shape our plans. And that's what we're here to do tonight, and we'll continue to do so. And to run transparent processes that do not cater to any special interests. And finally, to bring the private sector, create the conditions for the private sector to invest in waterfront revitalization. And we've taken this mandate very seriously over the past 15 years, and we'll continue to do that as we move forward with this Keysight project. So Waterfront Toronto has to balance a number of leadership roles. First and foremost, we are a catalyst and a steward for waterfront revitalization on behalf of all three levels of government. Fairly unique position. But we're also a landowner, and in the case of Keyside, we own most of the lands. The city owns some, and this site is privately owned by the private sector. And all of the revenues that we obtain through land ownership get put back into additional uh, waterfront revitalization. But we're also a partner, and in order to deliver on our mandate, we partner with a variety of organizations, including major private sector developers such as Great Gulf, 
um, Urban Capital, um, Tridel, all of those. We also um, partner with a variety of government agencies, such as Infrastructure Ontario, who we worked on and delivered the Pan Am Athletes Village. We also work with a lot of nonprofit organizations. An example would be Artscape, where we're delivering um, 80 units of affordable rental housing just across the street. And that's important to note that we do partnerships because we ran a global competitive process through an RFP and we selected Sidewalk Labs as our innovation and funding partner for Keyside. And since then, we've been working very hard with Sidewalk to define both of our roles and responsibilities to one another through the plan development agreement, which clearly articulates Waterfront Toronto's role as the lead on revitalization, but recognizes our other roles as landowner um, and partner. And it also recognizes what, Waterfront, or what uh, Sidewalk Labs brings to table, which is the innovation and the great thinking and the funding to, to look at that, at the an innovation and transformation. In the end, the project will need to deliver on Waterfront Toronto's public mandate. So let me put Keyside into context for the larger revitalization project. We've done a lot of work across the waterfront. This uh, map shows you the designated waterfront area. It's a very large area. Um, we have uh, done our part of the involvement in the West Donlands, which delivers um, many market housing units, over 500 affordable rental housing units, community center, parks, public spaces, um, all of those things, transit-oriented uh, development as well as um, pedestrian and cycling access. We've also delivered on the west side of the designated waterfront area with uh, collaboration with Infrastructure Ontario on the Ontario Place uh, Park and Trail. And then in the central waterfront, we have delivered a revitalized Queen's Quay, which I hope many of you have enjoyed over the past number of years. When we looked at, at Keyside, you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago, we said all of our developers will do lead gold. And at the time, that was transformational. When we came to Keyside, we said, what is the next revolution? What, what is the next hugely transformative uh, ask that we can make of our partners to deliver and layer on a game-changing um, layer of innovation so that we can be an exemplar to the world? And so we push that envelope through our RFP and our partnership with Sidewalk Labs will help us meet that mandate. And as always, the public will come along with us every step of the way, at every stage. We will be getting your input, your feedback, and we'll be reflecting that back to you in the plans that we bring forward. So in terms of additional public engagement, um, Waterfront Toronto's design review panel will be looking at all of the plans that come forward for the Keyside project. And you can see the dates. It's usually a monthly meeting. It's open to the public. We also have our digital strategy advisory panel. It's had its inaugural meeting. Um, it will have its second meeting this Thursday. Again, open to the public. It's at Waterfront Toronto. There are a number of other dates uh, scheduled for the uh, digital strategy advisory panel to meet and take feedback and input. And as all, also, we're going to be having some civic labs, civic labs, which will be focused on data governance and privacy. Tentative dates are scheduled. You'll see those. Um, we will firm those up. All that information will be on the Sidewalk Toronto website as well as the Waterfront Toronto website so that you have um, full knowledge of those and you're able to participate. So where are we in the process now with roundtable number three? Roundtables one and two were really meant to introduce Sidewalk Labs to you all, to Toronto, to tell you about their vision, their innovation, what they bring to the table. The roundtable tonight is really to bring you ideas around the building blocks for Keyside. And then for roundtable four, we'll be bringing forward a draft master innovation and development plan for the Keyside project. This will look at Keyside specifically and will look at the context in the larger area. In roundtable number five, we will be bringing back another version of the Master Innovation and Development Plan that will reflect the feedback that we've obtained through the various um, engagement, not just the roundtables, but all the other engagement um, uh, venues that we have, all of them listed on uh, both websites. And so with that um, collective uh, opportunity, we'll be feeding that back to you through uh, roundtable number five. So with that sort of contact set, I want to give it back to Aaron and Haban to um, take you through the next speakers. Excellent. Thanks, Meg. Thank you so much. 
Um, and I know that Meg's going to be back in about uh, 50 minutes or so to take questions on behalf of Waterfront Toronto um, from all of you. So really our job is pretty simple tonight. Aaron and I are he here to help explain what our teams have been working on since the last time that we met back in the spring. And to do that, we're going to introduce some of our favorite people, um, some of whom are up at the front right now. Um, and they've been working really hard on different parts of the Keyside project. And we're frankly also up here to keep time. Now there's a heck of a lot of information that we want to get through this evening. And in order to do that, we've got to keep a pretty tight ship to get through all of that material. So really I'm saying this to some, some of my colleagues and friends who are sitting off to the side here. If you see Aaron and I standing up and kind of giving you that look, it means you've got to wrap up your presentation pretty quickly. And we're serious about that. We will be keeping things on track. Um, it's important that we share all the material that we brought tonight, uh, of course, because we want you all to see how things are shaping up. Um, but even more importantly, we want to make sure that we have plenty of time for you to all ask questions of Meg and the rest of the team, uh, and then subsequently to uh, gather around all the round tables, some of which you have, are already there, um, to make sure that we have an opportunity to have a, a more robust discussion uh, in smaller groups. Um, so once we've had a chance to go through all the material, we will make those transitions into the Q&A and then subsequently into the roundtables. Um, and for all of you who are also watching online, we're doing a webcast right now, um, you will also have the opportunity to access the workbooks for the roundtable discussions. And you can submit them to us uh, anytime afterwards. Um, and we'd be happy to get that input as well. Um, and of course, I should also mention that there are a lot of people here in the room and we hope that you'll take a chance uh, at some point through the evening to go speak with them directly. And as Aaron said, there's definitely a lot of folks here tonight. Uh, some of them are part of our facilitation and note-taking team. Others are some of our subject matter experts. And some are part of the management team from Waterfront Toronto and Sidewalk Labs. You'll see around the room, many of them are wearing blue t-shirts. They're also wearing name tags. So for a second, can we get some of the folks with the blue t-shirts to just raise your hands? If you have name tags and blue t-shirts, just raise your hands. Perfect. So you can see that they're scattered around the room, and they're really all here to make sure that we can answer some of your questions tonight. So if you need anything, any logistical help or anything like that, uh, go flag down somebody in a blue shirt. Or, of course, you can also go to the front door uh, at the, the welcome desk, uh, which you pass on your way in. Um, which is actually a good segue. Uh, the other thing you might notice is that tonight we are in a different venue. Um, and so I think that we should uh, introduce and welcome people to the space. So welcome to the space. Now, 307 opened earlier this summer, and I have the incredible privilege of getting to work here every day. And this place is unlike anywhere I've ever worked before. It is part cultural center, part laboratory, part exhibit place, part meetings place. It is this totally new kind of interesting place to work. Um, and what's so exciting about it is that we do a number of different things here. What it's so important that I think is important to emphasize is that not only is it a place for our team to work, but also an opportunity for the public to learn a little bit more about the innovations and the ideas that are coming forward as part of the work that we do. So if anyone was actually coming here tonight thinking that this was some sort of a condo sales center, I hope you're really getting the chance to see that it, it's really anything but that. It's, it's, uh, it's not that indeed. Um, one of the hardest things that we find in describing this project is just how much we're really trying to start from first principles to understand what it takes to actually put the great features and components together to, to establish a community. Um, and so I think that, you know, we talk a lot about the word innovation, we talk, you know, it probably feels really empty by this point, um, but I think what you can see around you throughout this room represents uh, what Sidewalk Labs is working on, what they're exploring. You can see in front of you, you've got um, pavement, which is, uh, can be heated and lit, um, to everything about how you can ma better manage the traffic outside on Queens Quay and on Lakeshore and Parliament. So there's, there's really some incredible innovations right in front of us in this room. Um, and it's worth emphasizing that Sidewalk Labs has people researching those from first principles, um, many of whom are here tonight, who you can go up and, and talk to some of these innovations about. Um, everything from how to power homes with DC power to how to capture waste heat from various sources uh, and new building construction materials, some of which you're gonna hear about later on. And we're also studying new ways to interact with the lake. And part of our work involves talking with some of the world's greatest architects and designers. 
Now there's so much activity underway right now because we believe that it's important for us to really start with some of this applied research in order to create something that's really special. And tonight is really part of this work because along the way we've been talking with thousands of folks like you who live here in the city of Toronto and really have a sense of what works and simply what doesn't. And what you've already heard from Meg is that this project uh, is going to have a longer timeline than initially anticipated. And that's because, as we described, this work is really complicated and that it's going to take a lot of time. So basically right now, we are at the midpoint in developing what is a proposal for Keyside. And you're going to hear more about that. Um, and also what might have interesting applications elsewhere on the waterfront. But what's really incredibly important that everybody understand is that the proposals that we're coming forward with in the winter is just that. It's really a proposal. And as we all know, that proposal will be subject to much interest and scrutiny and many more conversations and discussions. Some of that will involve our team at Sidewalk Labs, but much of it will involve the City of Toronto and Waterfront Toronto. Because ultimately, it'll be up to them to decide whether or not we're going to move forward with some of these ideas. So we'll be having many more discussions and conversations like this and many more meetings like the one we're having tonight. And speaking of tonight's conversation, uh, one question we get a lot of is, what is Keyside going to look like? And truthfully, that is not something we know yet. But tonight, uh, what you're all going to get is um, some images that will begin to show you a little bit about what Keyside might feel like. Um, some of those you can already see on the tables in front of you. Um, so it's not yet a plan, but these illustrations will help you to start to think about where we're headed. Um, this is brand new work, uh, huge kudos to the team that has put it together, and it's based on not only our ideas, both at Waterfront and at Sidewalk Labs, but from the voices of all the Torontonians who have been engaged to date. So the last time we met, we talked about data, we talked about digital privacy, and we talked about mobility. And tonight, we're going to be talking about our vision for the public realm for Keyside. And by that, I mean really all the public spaces that make up the neighborhoods. It's the parks, it's plazas, it's sidewalks, and it's really all those in-between spaces. We're also going to talk about the streets and how they work and how they might function. And finally, we're going to talk about buildings and some of the key features that will make some of these buildings pretty unique. As you can see behind us now, um, We'd like to recap some of the ways that we've been engaging Toronto residents already. Um, these roundtables, like tonight, get a lot of attention. As you can see, there's a lot of people in the room all at once. Um, but one of the reasons Sidewalk Labs opened this office is to allow for a more dynamic and, and ongoing engagement of the public. And so at any point, just about any time, you can come and see some of the work that's underway and engage with the team. So we also know that it's actually hard to cover everything that we want to talk about in a meeting like this. So we have special open doors programming here at 307, Wednesdays evenings and Sunday afternoons, for the public to come and continue to share and to have this conversation. And since we've opened, more than 4,000 people have come through those very doors. Now we've also launched a series of public talks, starting with complete streets and affordable housing, as well as a reference panel, a residence reference panel, and a fellowship program. And those really allow for a smaller group of Torontonians to have a more intense look at our project. Now, both the residence reference panel, as well as the fellows program, will actually be releasing their own reports starting in the fall. And to get into some of what was discussed at our last round table, um, we heard a lot, and some of you who are here tonight were likely at that roundtable as well, and so I expect that you'll agree with some of these, these outcomes. Um, we really heard that you want to understand when and how data will be collected and how consent will be obtained. We also heard that it was critical to have a good mix of housing options that make Keyside attractive to different households and different incomes. And we heard, loudly, that you wanted to receive more detailed information about the actual plan for Keyside. But this is really only a fraction of what we've heard to date. And to really kick things off, I'm going to start by introducing Jesse Shapins, our Director of Public Realm and Sidewalk Labs, and Pina Malazzi, Director of Design at Waterfront Toronto. And they're going to be able to tell you a little bit more about what their team has been working on for the Public Realm at Keyside. So welcome, Jesse. Hi. Fantastic. 
Um, thank you. Thank you, Haban. Um, all right, let me grab that for you. Perfect. Um, it's an incredible honor to be here tonight sharing these ideas with everyone. Um, so at our first round table, some of you might have remembered um, that there was a question that we asked, and then sort of the question that we have been asking ourselves at Sidewalk Toronto from the beginning of this project, which is how might we create a people-first city in the digital age? And so this is actually really, really important to us. Um, I lead our public realm team, as Haban said, working closely with Pina. And in order to understand this question, we really embarked on a, on a unique kind of research initiative to go deep with a very small number of people across the Toronto region to learn about how public space works in their communities and how we can really learn about how that can be applied to creating a place at Keyside that is truly inclusive, welcoming, and inviting for people of all backgrounds to live, work, and come and spend time here. And this is a different type of approach. It's very additive to all the consultations we've been doing, the conversations like tonight. It allows us to kind of learn and think about and understand places in a slightly different way. And so we've been working with some exceptional partners on this project. Um, you might be familiar with Park People. They're an incredible local charity that has been around now for a long time, focused on the mission of improving public spaces across Toronto and Canada. And we worked with Doblin, who's a research team here, focused on deep ethnographic study. Um, so we're gonna be releasing this report um, in the fall to the public and doing a special event around that. But just because it's such an important set of insights and I think really helps you understand some of the things that we're bringing into our design process, we wanted to share a couple of themes tonight. So, so one of the things that we learned and we saw in this research was this idea of designing a living room and not a formal room. And one of, you know, the thing that was amazing is, it might not sound that surprising, but people of all backgrounds are incredibly sophisticated in how they read signs in public space. They can tell very clearly if they feel like a space is designed for them or for somebody else. And what we observed is that the thing that most made a place feel inviting and welcoming to a really diverse community was whether there was evidence of use, whether you could sort of see in the space that other people had shaped it and made it their own. So in some ways that it wasn't too polished. And actually one of the examples that they brought up was the wave decks here on the waterfront um, and how something like this really shows the wear of time on the wood through the water and how there's so many different types of people using it in really creative and interesting ways. Things like bake ovens, things like fire pits, all these things that you see that sort of you see them and you're like, wait, there's people here that are making the space their own. It's not sort of a place that sort of somebody else has made perfect. This is a place that I can make for myself. And that's something we really want to bring into the design approach for Keyside. Something else that we learned in this process was how important it is to foster small human interactions. And again, on the surface, this might not sound surprising. Like we all recognize that in great communities, we have strong connections with each other. I think one of the things that we found interesting was a lot of people brought up in particular how cell phones were things that they were really worried about actually creating greater social isolation. People talked about how they used to go to their neighborhood park, they used to go to their neighborhood playground, and they'd be t maybe spark up a conversation with another parent. And now, it's often just parents on their phone. And you know, again, this might be surprising coming from a tech company or something to be talking about things like this, but we take this really seriously. Technology on its own is just not gonna make great places. We have to be really thoughtful about the way technology impacts our lives, and actually we're thinking about ideas in Keyside of maybe we should make spaces where specifically you can't access the internet. Spaces where network connectivity is not available or only available at certain times because we really want to focus on how do we foster small human interactions. And one other piece that was interesting throughout the research was learning how people relate to and interact with the waterfront today. Um, not surprisingly, people love the lake. Um, it's such an incredible resource for this community and the, the region at large. Um, but one thing that did come out was that for a lot of people, the central waterfront is a place they come on special occasions. Maybe they'll come to a concert at the Harborfront Center, maybe passing through, going to the ferry terminal, going to a barbecue at the islands. Um, but it was slightly different maybe than some of the places like Ashbridge's Bay or Rouge Beach or the Bluffs, places where people are really going in these communities on a regular basis. And this is actually exciting to us. I think Keyside, as you'll see as we talk more and more about the location, sits at this really interesting juncture where we believe there's a unique opportunity to create a place that really is an everyday neighborhood. It brings to life and we maybe can introduce things like the things that people go to a place like Ashbridge's Bay on a regular basis, swimming, fire pits, things like that. Could we have that on Keyside to make this a really welcoming and inclusive community? So 
those are just some of the things, actually, some of the researchers that worked on this project are here tonight. If you want to ask more questions, we'll be doing a dedicated session in a little bit. But we thought it was really important to share those with you because they really inform how we think about Keyside in this special place. So we're going to share some of the early thinking that we're doing on that. Um, we've already got a lot of context. As you guys have been to public meetings, you always know, like, context is super important. Just a little more context. Um, building on that user research, we really recognize, again, Keyside, while it's part of the central waterfront, it's also part of the overall lakefront. And so we've been really thinking about it in that broader context. And so when you zoom in, this is really what it is. This is Keyside. This is the really specific context now in which we're working. Um, Toronto, of course, it's a city of neighborhoods. We, we love that about this place. And we recognize then the opportunity for Keyside to be connected to these really incredible communities nearby. So places like St. Lawrence, Distillery District, West Onlands. We've been meeting with all the neighborhood associations in these places and we'll continue to think about how Keyside can be deeply connected to these existing communities. And Keyside's at such an incredible place with how the city meets the lake in nature. So it's right here in relationship to the Inner Harbor that offers up new opportunities to engage with the lake how it connects to the islands, how it connects the incredible new work that's happening with the naturalization of the Don River, up through the ravines. You can even think about how this can be connected to places, new parks like the Meadowway that are underway. You can have a continuous experience of a public realm that could bring you all the way out to the Rouge. And so as you think about this as well, you think about how it relates to the, to the development that's already happened on the waterfront. You have things like Harborfront Center, Sugar Beach and in, in, in East Bayfront, West Onlands, in the mouth of the Don Naturalization Project. Keyside sits right at the center of all this incredible activity. And so that's the context in which we think about then Keyside as a test bed for urban innovation. You know, this is, as Meg mentioned, they recognize the waterfront Toronto, the incredibly unique place that this, this area sits. And so the opportunity to really think differently about some exciting questions, like how could we look to the past and learn from that to imagine how we might create a better future? So that's the context in which we're working. Um, and if we zoom in just a little more, you see this is really what it is. We're on Keyside right now. It's this building. It's an active construction site across the street for Bayside. And it's the Mond building, you know, is just down the street here uh, finishing up. And so this is the specific planning area. You have Bonnie Castle over on the west. You've got Lakeshore up on the north. You've got the Victory Soya Mill silo here on the east. You've got the Parliament Slip and Inner Harbor and Queen's Key on the south. So these are the 12 acres of Keyside. So of course that's the geographic context that's really important, but as we've been approaching the planning and design, zoning is of course also really important. So we just wanted you to understand what the current zoning is for this place. Right now it's approximately 3 million square feet. That means that you could have um, up to 90% residential, which would be about 3,000 total units. And the current zoning considers a series of taller buildings, up to about 19 stories, and you could have a tower that's 42 and another tower that's up to 50. We're gonna talk more about our building innovations and how we believe that applying that approach will result in a more mid-rise community, but we really wanted you to understand the context in which we're currently working. And so with that, I wanna turn it over to Pina, who's gonna tell you more about all that. Thanks, Jesse. I'm Pina, and I've been working on, on waterfront revitalization for about 12 years now and have worked on a wide range of projects. I've overseen the design and delivery of the wave decks, for example, Queen's Key, and more recently, I've been working on the design and implementation of the Portland's Flood Protection Project. I'm a landscape architect and have a true passion for creating public realm that reflects community needs and fully integrates into all aspects of our urban infrastructure. Uh, Waterfront Toronto recognized the opportunity to use the Keyside site as a test bed for many of Toronto's long-standing public policy objectives. And since October, we've worked together with uh, Sidewalk Labs to ground the planning for Keyside in the objectives from our foundational policy documents. First of all, the 2003 Central Waterfront Secondary Plan, which is the district official plan for the area. The 2005 East Bayfront Precinct Plan, and the 2010 Keating Channel Precinct Plan. Those are the two precinct plans that govern the planning for the Keyside site, which happens to straddle the two plans. Um, and I'm gonna take a few minutes uh, this evening to walk you through some specific examples from these plans um, and how uh, they apply to the work we're doing here at Keysight. And I'm gonna start with the creation of a connected uh, and high quality public realm. As Meg mentioned, Waterfront Toronto has a commitment 
to leading with the construction of the parks in public realm and creating spaces with a high quality of design, like Sugar Beach, for example. In keeping with the secondary uh, plan policy that you see here up on the slide, a bold new system of connected waterfront parks and public spaces will be developed, reflecting the industrial heritage and dock wall legacy of the area and anticipating its extraordinary use. We see Keyside and the public realm framework that Jesse will soon walk through continuing in this tradition. The waterfront streets as places. The secondary plan and the City of Toronto's guidelines for complete streets also highlight streets as integral elements of our public realm. Waterfront streets will be remade as places with distinct identities. Streets will, streets will act as lively urban connections as well as traffic arteries. The need of, needs of motorists will be balanced with efficient transit service and high quality amenities for pedestrians and cyclists. And you're gonna see um, Rit and Willa who work on the mobility pillar walk you through some of the thinking about streets and share some ideas for Queen's Key a little later on. Outdoor comfort on the waterfront is an ongoing challenge, which anyone who lives or works here, like we do, uh, knows what I'm talking about. It can be pretty brutal down here. Our policy documents have long been committed to trying to create experiences that provide a comfortable setting during all seasons of the year. And the East Bayfront Precinct Plan uh, proposed tall colonnades and seasonal weather protection along the sun-oriented retail and public frontages. And we actually haven't been able to deliver uh, these colonnades on any of the projects we've done to date uh, in a way that both blends with the architecture that has been emerging, but also functions. So um, tied closely, in addition to this, to outdoor comfort is how we envision the exceptional quality of the ground floor uh, and the uses within that ground floor and how they animate the public realm. The public realm pillar at Keyside has really been tackling these challenges head on and there's um, some outdoor comfort work you can see here on the side here and Jesse's gonna walk us through some of this in just a minute. Lastly, the secondary plan also recognizes the importance of public access on the water's edge. A continuous and highly accessible public water's edge promenade will connect a series of parks and open spaces, squares and plazas and at time these spaces will be intimate and at times generous. And all major north-south streets that enter the site from the north, for example, Parliament in the case of the Quayside site, will terminate at the water's edge with significant destinations. Um, what's exciting about Quayside is that we're taking these objectives and seeing how we can push them further with new technologies. The way I like to think about it is like a Rubik's Cube. We have these long-standing goals and now we're seeing how we can mix it up to achieve these goals in ways we never thought possible before. So I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse to show you how these foundational policies get translated into the site. Right. Thank you again, Pina. Um, so, you know, building on this incredible foundation um, and all the great planning and, and, and design work the Waterfront Toronto is doing, and then bringing in some new innovations, we really see how Keyside will be a part of a new complete community on the waterfront. Um, some of the things that, that we want to achieve here in our planning is to actually exceed affordability requirements on the site. And that's going to include a range of units for diverse household sizes and incomes. But a complete community isn't just about housing. Um, it's really important to us, and I think to many here, I'm sure, to think about all the other uses. And so we intend expanding the non-residential space for those uses. Um, and one of the other things that's really important is experimenting with new building types. Again, you're going to hear more about this from, from, from our team on the building side in a little bit. But that approach, we think, is going to lead to fewer towers than are currently zoned and a different type of mid-rise experience in this neighborhood. Um, and then really building on the, the approach that Waterfront Toronto has been taking now for a long time, we see the starting point of creating a complete community to begin with the public realm. This is, again, as, as Haban said, when we think about the public realm, it's all the shared spaces of community. It's the spaces like parks, it's plazas, it's ground floor shops, sidewalks, it's really any other place that people can come together. And in our minds, this has to be the foundation of making a great place. So this is maybe what a standard public realm might look like on Keyside. It could be great, you've got incredible assets. You might have a park and a waterfront space that were really connected, great experience. But you might also then have sort of somewhat separately sort of streets that are left over between buildings. Um, we believe we can do something here that's different. We think we can do something better. 
Um, and so we've been looking for ways to actually create as much space for the public realm as we can, and explicitly to build on the objectives, the long-standing policy objectives, and use things like a different approach to streets, outdoor comfort, ground floor, and water to create more space for public life. So let's start with streets and, and pavement. So this is actually like quite possibly my favorite topic. It's like bizarrely nerdy, but if you really take streets seriously as these important parts of our public realm, you recognize that like they're made of pavement. We don't ever talk about it. It's around us all the time, but it's possibly one of the most important parts of our lives. And so here we're asking, what could we do with pavement that might make it better for people? And so when you start and think about a traditional street and you think about the pavement and the space for people, it's basically a sidewalk, quite narrow, made of concrete relegated to the side of the road. Then you're gonna have a curb and then a giant asphalt space in the middle that's made for cars. So we ask, what would it mean to make that more for people? So to start, maybe we can level the playing field. What if you remove the curb? So now everything is on an equal level. And then that gives you an opportunity to use pavement that's consistent, that can really be designed first for people. And so some of the things that that new type of paving might have is it can include heating. So certain areas could be heated, which means that in the winter there would never be any snow or ice, much easier and safer to walk, bicycle, roll in every way you could. Also really good for the environment, it means that there's no salt, which would mean great things for ecology, plants, and the lake. So another thing that we could incorporate into a different type of paving is our, our lights. So you're standing on that prototype right now, or sitting on this, um, and it just, just to be clear, in case people are wondering, we're not actually thinking of a future street made out of wood. <laughs> Just, just to get that question covered. Um, it, we are actually also gonna be showing in later this year um, some concrete pavers that bring together all these elements. We wanted to start quickly to get a sense of the experience, so we made it out of wood first. And so you see these lights here, and the, the thinking behind this is the way that space is usually allocated on the street now is fixed. You have, again, your curb, maybe paint, that signals different uses. It's hard to change, which means that it's more likely that there's less space for people. Maybe we could use something like lights to make it possible for spaces to be more often signaled to be just for pedestrian and public use. And so that's what we're interested in testing with this type of approach. We recognize, of course, the accessibility of it's really important. We're actually working with OCAD University's Inclusive Design Center to do a whole series of workshops on this street prototype to see how we can make something like that really accessible. And just also to make clear, we don't anticipate putting these hexagonal pavers everywhere the eye can see. Landscape is incredibly important. We're planning to integrate green zones into the streetscape to ensure that we can really have significant absorption of stormwater. And there's a couple other benefits of modularity. So this approach of having these very kind of flexible modular pavers means that each one of them can be individually removed. And what that means is that it's really easy to fix something like a pothole. You no longer need kind of a big process to go and fix up and tear up your street to fix something like that. So we're really excited about this type of approach to pavement. And so that's one way that we can make streets, spaces that are more usable for people more of the time. The other thing that Pina started to talk about was outdoor comfort and the weather. And we actually believe that we can double the amount of time outdoors that can be usable for people in Toronto. So let's, let's look at this, these two graphs right here. So on the top, what you see is the amount of usable hours of outdoor space in Toronto today. This is you know, a calculation based on rain, temperature, wind. Wind is actually the most important factor in many cases. And green is comfortable. You notice there's some, but there's not that much. The, the graph below is what happens if we apply an outdoor comfort system that allows us, as in particular you can see, to dramatically expand the shoulder seasons. So now we have many, many more months where outdoor spaces can really be used and active year round. And this drawing, what you're looking at, is something that we've been exploring with local partners, RWDI and Partisans. Um, it's called a building raincoat. And this is made out of a kind of new, lightweight, translucent material, um, really interesting material innovations that make something like this possible. And it can be attached to the facade of a building really simply, and it can actually even appear and disappear based on real-time weather. So maybe when it's raining, it knows that it can come out. When it's sunny, it can go away. And we think something like this could actually be, and in many ways, you know, instead of building another underground path, could we actually bring the public life up to the street, connect people more easily in those spaces, create something as comfortable, but really outdoors? What's that? Three minutes. Okay, I'm saying too many things. I was told not to use my script because I would be more, like, natural. Anyhow, I'll try to go really quickly. <laughs> 
script goes fast. Um, anyhow, so you, you increase, you, this is what it looks like if you have your sort of regular streets. Now you have a lot more space for the public realm if you introduce paving and outdoor comfort. A place like Parliament Plaza couldn't even be part of the public realm. So this is now some drawings. This is what a street might look like in Keyside. Then maybe this could be a lane where it could actually be Queens Key. You can start to see a different way that the street feels and works in a neighborhood like this. This could be a laneway that's coming down from the Mon building all the way through to through Sherburn Common down to Parliament Plaza. You can see the pavers and the new type of experience here. And as you can tell, the other part of the public realm that's really important are ground floors. And we see that as an integral part of the experience as well. So we've been exploring a concept called STOA. Um, this idea is taken actually from, 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 from Greece. It's a word that references the old colonnades, the space of mixing, where you had markets and democracy debates, all these things happening. We want to see that type of life on the ground floor in Keyside as well. And so STOA is this standardized, flexible system that allow, in many ways have a space like this, a very kind of open, flexible environment on the ground floor, but then has all these things like movable walls, flexible panel systems, fast four installations that allow the community to constantly evolve it themselves. So here's now what you start to see Keyside maybe starting to feel like and look like. This is what it starts to be when you put together STOA, when you mix that with outdoor comfort and some of the other innovations we've been looking at. We can zoom in. You can see something like a library now spilling out into the street, protected from the elements, in this case sun in the summer. Behind that you can see a new retailer starting to expand and open their shop. Above that maybe is a pop-up summer camp. If we move a little further along, you might have a local grocer. One of the things I want to make clear, Stowe is very flexible, but it doesn't mean that things are changing all the time. It's really important that there are staples of a community and local businesses people can count on, and we want to incorporate that into the plan as well. Stowe can also connect the ground floors and the floors above. Here you see maybe a coffee shop going up to a co-working space and a community garden. And over here, as it starts to get further into the fall, you can see the building raincoats coming out, market stalls that fit into this large open indoor space. And this is really now, as we move into the winter, how this space actually functions and can be really vibrant at this time of year as well. So all of you, I think, have printouts of this drawing on your tables. You can look at it more closely. Um, and there's an opportunity to give more feedback to the actual artist who's been rendering and showing in these as well in the back. So, I'm almost done, I promise. Um, this is what it looks like if you've incorporated the ground floor now into the public realm. You really start to see how so much more space is accessible to the public. And the last thing I want to talk about is, is water. So we are on the waterfront, and we really believe there's a unique opportunity to expand the public realm through water. This is something that Pina talked about as one of the fundamental guiding principles for the work of Waterfront Toronto from the beginning. And so when you look at what's been planned right now, actually, what you have in the current plans is actually to fill in Parliament Slip, to be able to create the opportunity for um, various vehicles to move over uh, in the extension of Queen's Key. So with this idea that we really want to create new opportunities to engage with and access the water, we've been wondering if we might be able to take a different approach. To start, what if we said, let's actually keep the slip the way it is. This is an incredible part of our dock wall legacy. That's an important part of what we're trying to preserve in this area and it allows us to have more water. It might even allow us to reinterpret the wave deck that was planned there as a series of bridges. Could those bridges then include the various modes moving over the slip? And the last thing is, let's not stop with adding water there. Let's bring it up to the moment you enter Keyside from Parliament. Pina mentioned that in the secondary plan, one of the fundamental objectives was to create incredible destinations from the north-south streets. We think we can do something entirely new and different here, where actually the moment you cross Lakeshore, you touch and feel water. So this is just an early concept drawing. There's a lot that needs to be worked out here around viability. We're talking to the city and the TTC about these types of concepts. It's going to need a lot more study. But we wanted to share it with you now to start to get your feedback. This is what that Parliament Gateway experience might start to feel like. You can see these bridges, this kind of new type of wave deck with all these different modes coming across the slip. You can see many active uses on the water. Maybe that's a kayak, it's a dragon boat, many ways that people are actually using the water itself. And then you can see that plaza space that I was talking about where we actually added more water. Maybe that's an environment that is something that we call a malleable plaza where it could actually shift at different times a day. It could be entirely flat or it could be terrace steps that come down and let people um, interact with the water and fountains in this way. 
and it would be directly connected to the open space in front of the silo. And in that area, we think we could do things that really allow people to come together more around nature, public art projections, recreational uses. One of the things that's planned for the site is a school, and we're actually excited about the prospect of that being here. Maybe we could have a playground and a basketball court that's used for the school during those at certain hours, but then is accessible for the community at all the other times of the year. And lastly, the water itself. It's such an important part of the public realm, as we've been saying. Maybe we could add new ways to engage with water on the water, add a floating swimming pool or a sauna there that allows you to really get in the water itself here at Keyside. So again, very excited to hear everyone's feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much. Here, I'm going to put this right here for the next presenter. Um, you know, we really, we were thinking about cutting you guys off, but that was, that was too cool. We couldn't, we couldn't just jump in in the middle of that. So uh, if we go over, uh, we apologize. Um, I wanted to also note that there's a lot of things around the room that reflect some of the things that Jesse and Pina talked about. Uh, the raincoat, some of the, the um, weather protection stuff. So definitely encourage you all later on to go out and, and check that out. Um, Pina and Jesse, we're going to have you guys up in two presentations from now to answer some questions as well. So if you did have questions, just write them down and remember them in a few minutes. Uh, next up, to talk to us about the streets at Keyside, uh, let me introduce to you Rit Egerwala, Head of Urban Systems at Sidewalk Labs, and Willa Ng, the Associate Director of Mobility at Sidewalk Labs. Thank you. So, so, of course, an integral part of any urban neighborhood is the transportation system. And one of the challenges that streets impose on the public realm, as Jesse described, is how we actually allocate space, how we facilitate movement, and how we reduce conflicts among the different users, the pedestrians, the cyclists, the streetcars, the vehicles, the trucks. Um, and so one of the questions that we want to ask you to think about and give us your thoughts on is how far we should be going in the plan for Keyside to change the way we understand streets. We've done a lot of thinking on rethinking the street itself, how we recalibrate those space allocations. And the fundamental question here is how far we should go. I don't have to tell you that our city streets today, both here in Toronto and around the world, are not really working that well. Right? By and large, we suffer from congestion. They're designed around the automobile. They aren't managed the way they ought to be. You have lots of conflicts from, from the overuse. And usually, if anyone suffers, it is the pedestrian. It is the cyclist. It's the person outside of a container. Now, Toronto, as a city, has done more than many. It has been at the cutting edge on so many things, and you're all familiar with them. The work on Queens Key West, led by Waterfront Toronto, St. Lawrence Market and some of the streets around it, which actually changed their usage on the weekend and the weekday, and, by, and according to the season. And of course, recently, the pilot on King Street West, which has rethought the relative prioritization between transit and private automobile use on our streets. But we think Keyside offers us the opportunity to go even farther than those, because one of the great, great opportunities here is the usage patterns for this space are undefined. There aren't a lot of users here. There aren't driveways. There aren't builders or buildings already existing. We don't have to respect any existing uses because it's almost a greenfield, even though it's really a brownfield. So we've rethought how one might imagine streets to talk about how that might work at a theoretical level, I'd like to ask Willa to take over. Thank you. Hi, I'm Willa, um, and I'm a traffic engineer on the Sidewalk Toronto mobility team. And it's actually been a really exciting couple of years for uh, traffic engineering. Um, there have been some advances in technology, design, and policy, all three of which are necessary for us to sort of reimagine how the street can work. So technology-wise, you are sitting on um, what our prototype is of a dynamic pavement. 
Um, like Jesse said, it's not going to look like this. It's probably going to be a little bit smaller. We're looking at technologies where we can actually change the color of the entire paver, which is good because I've been staring directly down into the light and now I can only see like a big circle where your faces are. So, um, so bear with me on the rest of this. Um, the other part of it is autonomous vehicles. Now we've heard a lot about autonomous vehicles. How cool is it that they can drive themselves? What we've been looking at instead is actually how can we take advantage of the autonomous vehicle and its characteristics? Um, as a traffic engineer, you know, if you look out at Lakeshore Boulevard right now, you'll see that there's a lot of pavement that's there in order to protect people from what a car might do. Now, if we try to reimagine about how a car might be more docile, how it might need less space, narrower lanes, and how it might actually be able to follow rules that we transmit to it um, and that we require it to follow, um, we might imagine actually starting to reclaim some of that space um, for pedestrians, for transit, and for cyclists. Design is actually also a huge part of it. I know you all saw the news too that uh, the Transportation Association of Canada released its second edition of the Canadian Guide to Traffic Calming. Um, very, very cool things in there. Not related to technology at all. Really about how different colors, textures, the narrowing of the streets can actually have a big impact on the way that the streets are used. And lastly is the policy. And that's why we're really here today and we want to hear from you. What should these streets do and how should they work? So you add those three together and you might get a street that looks like this, maybe not. This all depends on how the technology evolves, um, whether the AVs are gonna be ready in time, we don't know, whether the pavement that we're testing so, um, so urgently right now is going to be ready in time, um, but also, the design, we need to know which designs are effective. We actually need to understand what policies the people who live and work there want to see. So you're probably looking at this image and you're thinking, well, that kind of looks nice, but I have a lot of questions about this. Right? How does it move people? All right, how do I actually get my pizza delivered? How do I actually get my piano delivered? And so what we're actually thinking through is not asking one street to do everything, but looking at it as a network of streets. And I'm gonna just walk you through that idea right now. So as I walk through this, what I'd like to ask you to note is that each of the streets that I'm going to talk about have different widths, have different speeds, and are prioritized for different modes. So we're going to start with the boulevard. This is a 38 meter wide street. It's going to be the street that is most recognizable to you. Um, it will balance all of the modes and it'll probably have things like traffic lights and lane markings. We are proposing though to limit the speed on the street to 40 kilometers per hour. The next is the transit way, 26 meters wide, prioritized for transit, but because we are proposing to ban traditional vehicles from this street, all of the exciting things that we're talking about in terms of dynamic pavement and the flexibility of um, autonomous vehicles, we start to see here. This is where we can start to actually see more zones flex to pedestrian and cyclist use. The next is the access way. This is a 16 meter wide street with a speed limit of 20 kilometers per hour. will form the core part of the cycling network. And the last is the laneway. At 11 meters wide, this is going to be a street that's prioritized for pedestrian movement. And it is one that has a speed limit of eight kilometers per hour or walking speed. So when we actually add this all together, we, we notice a couple of things. Number one, we are limiting the speeds on this street. One of the things that is no surprise to you that Toronto is struggling with is transportation fatalities. Um, Toronto is actually one of the few world cities where the fatalities per capita is increasing year over year. Something needs to be done and the streets can play a big part of that. And so we think that limiting the speeds will limit the severity of any of these crashes. The other is that we need to maintain access. Uh, AODA, so uh, the disabled may be accessed on all of these streets. Emergency access is retained on all of these streets. Um, but we also strive to maintain access to the buildings on at least two sides using these four street typologies. And really, at the end of the day, what we think the opportunity is here is 
We don't know what's going to happen with the autonomous vehicles. Nobody does. But as they're coming, they're adapting and training on the streets out there today. We think that Keyside provides us the opportunity to, des to design the streets that we want to see and make the AVs tow a new line and meet a new standard. So I'm just going to walk you really quickly through how the streets might actually work as building blocks with what Jesse talked about in public realm and what Kareem is going to talk about with buildings. So this is what a typical street might look like. Next, we can narrow it for the appropriate mode, whether that's cyclists or walking or transit. And then we can start to do some interesting things. So for instance, that laneway that we talked about, we are able to shift this grid because it doesn't need to go straight and we can actually create some space for pedestrian plazas. And that can happen throughout the network, actually. And we can start to actually create these little pockets where the community may actually have space to talk to each other. The dynamic pavement and the different uses actually allows us to flex that space into a public plaza or an event space when necessary, and we can move people through the, the system at things like commute times while maintaining, again, access to all of the buildings, which is important for the street to do. And as we start to layer on different things like the buildings, Jesse talked about the porous ground use, we can start to imagine a street where the public space actually flows between the street and into the building. And so what we get is sort of a breaking up of the superblock into a new grid that focuses on pedestrian and community space. And so I'm going to hand it back to Rit to really talk about how these four ideas might play out in Key, Queens Key. Thank you. Um, what Willa just described is a concept. It's an archetype. It's a theory of the street. Um, and of course, that four square is probably not something that you could fit into this L-shaped parcel of Keyside. So that's not a plan. It's a concept. It's an inspiration. And, and one of the things we want to ask you tonight, though, is how far towards some of these ideas do you think we ought to go, especially when it comes to what is inevitably going to be the core mobility experience of Keyside, which is this extension of Queen's Key that would start about here and move over to the other side of the slip, as Jesse showed. We've thought about a bunch of options. We could go as far as some of our ideas uh, might take us, or we could actually lean towards the conservative. Some of it's a bit of a bet on how quickly we think autonomous vehicles might be ready for action. Um, some of it, though, is actually a bet on how much we're willing to throttle back uh, different demands on that street uh, from different users. So we start with perhaps the most traditional. If we think about Queens Key East and its extension to Cherry Street primarily as a thoroughfare, as a way to relieve traffic congestion on Lakeshore Boulevard, we'd design something like this. You'd have multiple lanes going in either direction for traditional vehicles. You'd have that high-speed LRT right-of-way in the center corridor, and you'd have sidewalks of a normal size. If we want to extend more of the theory of, of the street that you see on Queens Key West, we might do something like this. It's about the same balance that you have on the west side of Bay Street on Queens Key. You have a generous bike lane. You have broader sidewalks that are more comfortable. They're still sidewalks. They're by no means places to rest or spend too much time other than at the, at the waves. Um, and you have a drop-off lane because you actually only want to stimulate a certain amount of pickups and drop-offs. Uh, but that is a fixed lane. You can't really change that over time. If some of our ideas around the dynamic pavement, around using lighting and other movable objects, uh, allow us to reallocate space in real time, we might be able to do something like this. By eliminating the turning lane, which we could do because we don't have driveways already designed, so we could design around some of the needs for a turning lane that you have on Queens Key West, you can add a lot more space to the public realm, to those sidewalks, and instead of having drop-off zones that are permanently designed as asphalt for cars, they could flex back and forth in the mornings, during rush hour, or whatever. When you have a lot of pickups and drop-offs happening, they're there for that purpose. During lunchtime, perhaps, when you actually have a lot more pedestrians on the street in good weather, you'd reallocate that to sidewalk space. We could go even farther. Why is it that a street that doesn't currently exist has to be a two-way street? 
maybe we actually only have one travel lane for traditional vehicles as we extend Queen's Key. Um, then what we might do is something like this, and what you see on, sorry, your left, um, is a sidewalk that becomes so big that it begins to be more of a plaza. You can think about programming that space. You could think about permanent sidewalk cafes, some of the installations that appeared in the drawings that Jesse showed. And we could take this even farther. We could make a bet that at some point autonomous vehicles will arrive and we design that into the street. If you have a docile autonomous vehicle, it is possible that it could actually share the right of way with the streetcars without impeding transit speeds. Right? It's kind of ironic, it's kind of counterintuitive because of course this is exactly what the King Street pilot and, and other separated rights of ways are trying to get away from. But as Willa pointed out, it would be a bet on the idea that with the more docile, the responsible technology that is programmed into autonomous vehicles, we can make it work, we can really make that space efficient. This is an idea that requires a lot of exploration. We've started talking about it with the city and with TTC. Um, but it is possible to conceive of. Um, and what this really does is it gets even more space. This basically begins to feel like a transit line and a great big bike path through a park. It's not really a boulevard or a street the way we understand it today. So these are the five options. Um, they're on your tables and we'd really love your feedback as to how far one might go. It's an allocation question, it's a risk-taking question, it's a prioritization question, and it's a question that we need to hear from you on. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Britt and Willa. I know there are many folks here tonight that are interested in continuing that conversation and speaking with you more at the uh, end of the formal part of the presentation. Our last presentation is actually about buildings at Keyside and how they actually might be different from conventional structures and spaces. And to explain, I want to introduce to you easily one of the coolest people I've met this year, Kareem Khalifa, the Director of Buildings and Innovation at Sidewalk Labs. Of course buildings are cool. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm the last here. I, I'll get to some uh, information in a few minutes and we'll uh, get to the round uh, the tables and discussions and questions. So really buildings, we have these four objectives. They're around adaptability, affordability, sustainability, and design excellence. And so these are the driving force as we think about buildings and when they need to be tomorrow. We're going to delve quite a bit, in, a little bit into uh, adaptability, and we want to talk about some of the flexible spaces that really support some of the things that Jesse has been describing and how that works in buildings. We'll also talk about uh, sustainability, and I'll talk about tall timber quite a bit. And finally, uh, design excellence is a very important part. We're really fortunate to have such an amazing project that we had attract excellent designers here in a natural way. But we also need to take design excellence and how we fit this design of buildings into the community to be really holistic. So I have lots of ideas to share with you, but I'm going to just sprinkle some of the ideas here on adaptability, the first one. So the first is we talk about panelized systems. And the reason we talk about panelized systems, is it possible for us to grow and shrink spaces over time? So imagine a retailer who would like to expand or maybe a retailer who can't afford all the space they have and needs to get smaller. So could we build in systems and panels that can be easily removed and adapt to that business need? And then it goes without saying, think about families, right? Starting out with a one bedroom and wanting to grow to a two bedroom and three bedroom as they have more children, and then as they age in place, wanting to shrink that space and not really have to move. So we've looked at both sides of systems here for panelized systems, both for the retail commercial applications and also residential. We talked about radical mixed use. So what if some percentage of our buildings actually allows people to coexist with different use cases? So could we have a floor plate that has residential and retail and maybe some light industry all on one floor plate? How could they all live together? 
Why don't they do that today? Because our code says this space is designated for one use case, this, this space is for a different use case. So we thought about putting in sensor technology, right? So if we can measure things that are nuisances to each other, some of these spaces could coexist. So if I know that somebody's emitting too much sound, they should be notified. But if they don't emit any, any more sound than is normal or is not a nuisance to me, they could be right next door, no matter what they're doing. I can do air quality. I can make sure there isn't a long queue at somebody's door. I can make sure that some people don't bring in really heavy materials for some industry that somebody didn't, didn't define. And we can use that space collectively. It doesn't mean it's door by door. It could be half a floor plate, a quarter of a floor plate. We could think of lots of arrangements to make that happen. But really change the way we look at our code to be sensor-based, performance-based of how people use spaces, and not defined because we just don't know how to control all those use cases in one spot. Adaptable building typologies. We know that buildings at the uh, turn of the century have very high ceilings, and we see those buildings used for they were industrial buildings, then they become re, uh, retail, um, then they become residential. And so we have all these mixed typologies. So what if we take a loft building, we call those loft buildings, and actually build them from the start, knowing that people can adapt them over time. And so in Keyside, we imagine we will have a loft building. One of the buildings will be of that type, so that we can constantly adapt some of the spaces and the way it's used. We also know that we're going to start with some centralized parking. And so with a building typology, if we do start with parking, what happens one day? And, you know, we think about 50 years when we talk about design, if we don't have as many, much need for parking. So we're going to build, those, build that parking lot from the start with the idea that it can be transformed to a different use case. So unlike some of the parking lots where elevators are in the corners and staircases are in the corners trying to leave all that open circulation for cars, what if we build it with the normal core that we would need for residential or commercial? And so we did quite some study of how to convert buildings from parking into a different use case in the future to future-proof our buildings. And then finally, underground delivery systems. We started to imagine that we could have freight coming underground or even at ground, but in through the building in some back channel. But how do we get the freight to go vertically? So we look at robotics traveling up and down in the building. So where does that resident want to collect their package? Is it a room on their floor where everybody goes to get their package? Does the package arrive at their doors? So we're leaving these options open to make sure we can try to take the freight, all those Amazon boxes, right, up and down through that building and making sure they get to a place that's controlled and convenient for uh, the residents. On affordability, we believe we will start off with cost neutral in Keyside and we will get less expense over time. We will need the scale bigger than Keyside to drive down that cost, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We imagine buildings can be powered on DC power. And one of the reasons DC power is interesting to us is it's not a shock hazard, right? So if we take away the idea of a shock hazard, we now no longer have to embed those wires inside of a conduit, inside of a wall. So if I can run them on the surface of a building somewhere, hidden, they won't be just hanging around, um, I can now remove that panel without any infrastructure. I don't have to call the electrician to move that, right? I take a lot of cost out of the spaces and I support my flexible building strategy. The proto model sizes that we started to work on because we looked at the massing and the 3.2 million square feet, we started with 10-story, 20-story, and 30-story buildings. They're all timber. We do proto models here because we want to really get cost targets and really work against a real building. They aren't the buildings that are going to be built here, but they're really models of what that building could be. So we're using that as a tool, and we put in our DC systems into those buildings, those movable panels, and we really look at how the building will function when it's finally designed for a specific site. And finally, some of the affordability is delivery of uh, material, and that is for the timber buildings. So when we try, when we manufacture pieces off-site for uh, modular construction, those are all sized appropriately to come in on freight trucks. So we don't leave any space or any volume or any weight unused on that truck. 
So interestingly enough, as we designed the building, we're already thinking about the factory. We're already thinking about the, the transport of the materials to the site. And uh, finally, um, uh, sustainability. We are um, aiming for Toronto Tier 3 green guidelines, and we have materials that are cradle to cradle. So some of you may be familiar with those. Those are some very high categories of sustainability. We have green roofs on our buildings, and if they're not green roofs, they're going to be photovoltaic to generate solar power for the community. On facade glazing, we have photochromatic glass envisioned. So if any of you have glasses that tint when it gets darker or lighter, we can have facades that do the same thing. So we want them to tint in the summer, right, to block out some of the heat that would come into the building. But in the winter, actually, we'd like them to go clear so we can gain all that solar heat and lower our energy bills for that uh, place. So all this can be defined using weather data and sun data of where we are in the climate of the year and what the weather forecast is for the next few days to, be optim to optimize that use. Sprinklers, we're looking at a mist system of sprinkler heads. Uh, these actually emit atomized water. They're able to blanket and put out fires very easily. Why are we interested in this? These sprinkler systems run on 3 8 inch tubing, very light tubing. Again, I don't have to embed them in my walls, and now my walls can be moved around much more easily, right? So I have no utilities now in my walls. Very different than where we all live today. So really, one of the big opportunities that we see is uh, building a tall timber technology on an unprecedented scale. And although we imagine Keyside to be about 3 million square feet, it's not nearly big enough for the scale and the reduction in cost that we would need. So that's a very important principle here. So I'm going to get into how this tall timber works and some of its characteristics. It's climate friendly. So we harvest our trees. It's certified forest. Canada owns the most certified forest in the world today. So those Forests are purposefully planted and cultivated in a systematic way not to reduce the overall forest of uh, Canada. It's actually been increasing because of this industry. And then we, get, we replant them. When we take those trees, we take CO2. The tree takes CO2 out of the at atmosphere through photosynthesis. It embeds it in the wood, and we put that wood into a building for 100 years. So actually, this industry is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. It could be an economic boost. Right? We have a new industry. This is a beautiful Canadian industry. You do have the most certified forest in the world. There's no reason to take advantage of it and grow this industry uh, beyond actually Toronto, Ontario, or the borders of Canada. We can achieve much faster construction by building all these materials off-site, having them cut to precision, and then brought on site to be assembled. And finally, cost savings. So we know we would be around near cost neutral in Keyside, but actually as we could expand over multiples of 10 acres, right, to 100 acres or 1,000 acres, we could envision that these prices start to, start to drop, just like any good manufacturing process. So we do have challenges, though, to get there. So one of them is the capacity of the height of buildings, and today we are topping out at 30 stories for a tall timber building. We know buildings that are going up at 20, so we were envisioning today that we could get to 30. The other is the industry capacity. So this is an interesting concept. Timber certified forest for Canada is growing at such a rate that we could build all of Keyside and timber in 100 minutes. That's how much growth we have in Canada. But the industry to cut those timbers to make those types of beams that we need here would take more than a year to produce the material out of their factories. So it's a big disparity. You can grow the, the wood in 100 minutes, but you need one year to manufacture it and turn it into pieces that we can use. This is the big challenge. Can we get the supply chain of Canada to join in to start creating a more efficient and higher quality product versus the two by fours that you find in, in, in a Home Depot? The building code, right now it only has pre-approval for build, wood buildings up to six stories. 
If you pass six stories, you have to submit a performance design that's reviewed. We think in a few years, 2021 is the goal of Canada to allow 12 stories, and then above 12 stories, you'd have a performance review. So we need to keep pushing that along. Part of the idea that we generated these proto-model designs is before we ever design a building, we can already get the authorities to review our buildings for that performance criteria to, to make sure that we can reach those 30 stories. And immediate cost, we talked about, it's all about scale and doing this at a much higher level. So there's lots of precedents in Canada. Canada is already having lots of really wonderful timber buildings going up. Uh, one of them is Brock Commons in Vancouver. Uh, this is a dormitory, right? So this is where we put our children into these buildings. Um, University of Toronto, and we also know the Arbor Project, which would be just across the street here uh, by George Brown College. I take this snapshot, this is Brock Commons. It has something to do with Jesse talked about, about STOA. So you see this concrete platform at the bottom. So those two floors below there would be what he, we would call STOA. And then that's in concrete. We may use concrete, we may use timber. The columns are glue lamb beams. Those are running up vertically in the building. And then the panels that are laying horizontally are called cross-laminated timber or CLT. And there's samples of some of these objects in the corner if you want to take a look at them later on. But it kind of gives you the feel of how these buildings would get assembled and the materials they use. I show you something very rectilinear. That doesn't mean we can't have artistry of architecture as well. And so I show you this. These are some of the beautiful forms that can be produced. We will need to have beautiful signature buildings in this environment as well, not all perfect rectilinears. Here's just kind of a vision of what maybe a gymnasium could look like at a school. Maybe an office or an academic building. And you can see really the offset between the, the very crisp white walls and the beautiful timber. We know that these timber buildings really are healthful for people, right? We respond very well to spaces that have t exposed timber to us. And one of the best precedents for that is really this uh, hospital in Ontario, where they actually put the timber into the lobby of the hospital. And you see trees there as well. This is all a design called biophilic design. And you can actually measure people's heart rates drop and calm in these atmospheres. So it was no mistake that they put this in a hospital waiting area where people can find some repose and, and during their recovery. There are even statistics that people who have rooms in hospitals that face these green spaces recuperate faster by about a day or two in their recovery time. And these have been tested over and over again. So these are very important ways that these hospitals can uh, perform. They're also great for us in our offices and residents. So here's an image, uh, a little bit of uh, what um, Jesse showed before. This was an architect's interpretation of that membrane coming down, that raincoat coming down, and trying to create a space that's weather protected. And here you can see, these are ideas, you know, these aren't final designs or anything, but how it might feel if you were to walk through a weather protected area. Of course, the facade there is quite porous, so people can travel in and out. Maybe we warm that space up to about 13 degrees Celsius in, in the winter. It doesn't have to come all the way up to 18 or 20. And in the summer, we can probably survive without air conditioning in a space like that. Right, so th imagine that space as you walk in is a place where you might unzip your coat, but you wouldn't take it off, right? But you'd be comfortable because there's no wind. So really, we see the mass timber at Keyside. We can really enable a unique living experience on the waterfront, expand housing options for a diverse range of residents. And we think really this is a wonderful opportunity for Canada to grow an industry, become a center of excellence for the world, because you really have this resource and you have the technical capacity to do so. Thank you. Kareem, thank you so much for that. That was, that was awesome. Um, so all of you, I'm sure, have many, many questions. Um, so we have now reached uh, the time. We're going to take about 20 questions uh, from the stage here. Um, 
And then, and everybody remember this, so after, after that, we're then gonna transition into the round tables, and we're gonna kind of provide a venue for some smaller group discussions after the Q&A. Um, and we're gonna do that, uh, uh, and then we're gonna come back, and we're gonna do a report out from those round tables. So that's kind of the sequence of the rest of the evening. We're gonna do Q&A, then we're gonna do round table discussions, and then we're gonna kind of report back on what was discussed at those table discussions, okay? We're gonna do that around that final piece, we're gonna do around 8 p.m. Um, so I would like to invite back up to the stage Meg. Uh, so Meg, we are gonna leave uh, the stage to you. Um, Haban and I are gonna run out and provide microphones to everybody there. The one thing I would ask, please keep your questions brief um, and focused and uh, it's just so we can get as much feedback from, from everybody as possible. Okay? Great, thanks you guys. Um, and if I can get the speakers and um, a couple more of our subject matter experts to come on up and um, they will be able to answer uh, the questions that you have. And uh, Aaron and Haban will be bringing you a microphone. Um, so we're ready to start right here in the front row. Hi there, I've got a quick question for the streets people. Um, I was very interested in the speed limits and the mixed use areas and so on. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the emergency vehicles and access for there because of course they're going to be moving a little quicker. Sure, uh, you know, and emergency access is one of those things where when you need it, you really need it. Um, and we don't expect that to happen. We do expect that to be an exception. But we have been looking at the widths of those streets and the turning radii of those streets to make sure that Toronto Fire and um, ambulances could actually get through there. Uh, the lady in the back. Oh, I, it, okay, oh, we got side? Okay. okay. Thanks for the next. presentation. I wanted to ask you if you could share some of the feedback you've received from your various advisory panels, because a number of you made reference to that, uh, and as well as the materials that they're receiving, and where are the materials at the Sidewalk Toronto Residence Reference Panel that uh, a couple of you mentioned uh, is receiving to inform their work and report? Uh, Rick, do you want to start with your, because each group has their own um, advisory panel. So. Yeah, and I'm sorry, what was, what was it you wanted about the advisory panels? So the feedback that you've received from your various advisory panels, how can that be shared with the public? Um, well, so we, we are currently using the advisory panels as, as both sources of expertise. Um, so there isn't one large piece of feedback, it is kind of ongoing. Um, I'd say, uh, you know, we've had our conversations that I've been part of, Pina and, and Willa, with the Mobility Advisory Panel, and, and frankly, one of the pieces of advice, I think, overall has been to be bold and, and be aggressive in, in our thinking. Um, you know, we could talk offline about more detailed, specific uh, pieces of feedback. I don't know, Jesse, do you want to talk about public realm? Sure. Um, the, the public realm advisory group has uh, we've met now three times. I think one of the one of the themes that was really important from the very beginning was the topic of inclusivity and how we are really and how we can take on the challenge of what it means to create a truly inclusive public realm in a place like this. Um, and so that's actually that was one of the inspirations for the the resident research that um, we shared here and sort of just the general thinking that has gone into the public realm that really thinks about. It's a place both for the people that live here and that future community and the affordability and the mix will have the mix of people that will work here. But again, how this is a place that is inviting and welcoming for people from across the Toronto as a whole. And that's been a really kind of key theme for the, for the working group um, over the past months. Is there somewhere where we can find the residents' reference panel suggestions? Um, we're just checking that for you right now. Why don't we come back to that once we've... Oh, Pina has something to add. There will be a report coming out of the reference panel, and it will be published in the fall, in about two to three months. Weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 
Hi, um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I see there's lots of exciting projects happening. I'm very excited for this. Uh, the question I want to ask is about uh, electrical vehicles. So what are the commitment that Sidewalk Lab has in terms of facilitating adoption of electrical vehicles and also what kind of planning in terms of charging infrastructures or designated lanes or spaces allocated for that? Thank you. Sure, well, um, as, as you point out, uh, you know, as part of our overall vision that climate, Sidewalk Toronto be climate positive, uh, we are very bullish on, on the prospects of electric vehicles to be a key component of the, the mobility solution here. We didn't tonight talk about the overall mobility concept, what we've been talking about thus far of really the local streets uh, within the district. And of course, for a site this size, the bulk of the traffic, the bulk of the tra travel is really to and from the site. So where we envision electric vehicles would be in the solution uh, for particularly residents, also people who are commuting here on a, on a regular basis uh, to, to work, to have an option for an electric vehicle. Um, we have ideas that we have proposed to Waterfront Toronto in our original proposal around shared vehicles, around uh, a budget or, or monthly allocations for ride sharing and, and the potential to explore microtransit. That's, that's a set of concepts we are working on and we'll have more to report back on that in the fall. But electric vehicles is certainly a, a core component of our vision. Uh, with the cost of um, housing so prohibitive in Toronto lately, um, I know you were talking about cost neutral, but that really doesn't say anything. Really what I want to know is what is there going to be for affordable housing and can we expand into the water, maybe do with something there where they've, things like they've done in Dubai? Or is that something that can be done here as well? Um, I'm going to tackle the first part of that question. Um, so Waterfront Toronto has a commitment uh, with the City of Toronto where we will deliver 20% of the land for affordable rental housing. Um, that's at or below CMHC average um, rents for uh, Toronto. So that is sort of the base case and through the various um, construction methodologies, construction materials, um, Sidewalk is looking at lowering the cost of the um, buildings themselves, therefore lowering the cost uh, to renters into families. Um, we're also looking at unique financial models. We're trying to find some other um, ways in which we can finance some of these buildings that aren't so reliant on government all the time and that how can we bring the private sector to the table to help us with the affordability piece. Um, as for building into the water, I think, you know, Jesse talked about building over the water. Um, I don't think we have looked at um, extending out into the water and adding uh, more developable area in the water. I think we've got um, a lot on our plate with the square footage that we have for Keyside, the 3 million square feet, but guaranteed 20% of that will be affordable rental housing as defined by the city in the Central Waterfront Secondary Plan. Sorry, sorry, I think we had, I'm just, uh, okay, Habon? Thank you. Yes, um, basically we know that the major cost of housing is not the housing at all, but it's the land. And we can actually do floating islands on the water. We've been trying to get you guys to look at that for more than a year, but particularly in the last six months, and we don't seem to be hearing that you're willing to even consider floating on water. Can you try to help me understand that why you don't want us to reduce the cost of housing by more than 30%? Um, so I'm not able to answer that specifically, but what I can tell you is that the land for the 20% will be free to the City of Toronto, remediated, serviced. That is the, um, that is the commitment we've made to the City of Toronto. So 20% of the land will in fact be free. I know, so this, this if, way it's much, you could do 50% free by not putting it on land, but by putting it on water. So why don't we um, talk about that a little bit more offline. I'm happy to discuss that with you um, because we can only take two more questions and I just want to make sure we give an opportunity to a couple others. There's a fellow at the back with his hand up. Can you stand up and Haban will bring you the microphone? Uh, hi, uh, so I have two quick questions. Uh, so one is about the streets. Um, so we saw there, uh, we basically talked about streets on a 2D typography. So I was wondering, uh, especially following what uh, boarding company is trying to do, essentially building tunnels and basically having 3D uh, uh, tunnels down the, uh, and having a 3D streets. Uh, so I was uh, wondering if uh, you've considered that as an option uh, to open up the roads for pedestrians more in future. Uh, my other question is regarding the buildings. 
Uh, so we talked about the timber buildings. So I was uh, wondering what's the safety record of these buildings, especially in, in cases of fire and, and such scenarios? Oh, I'll, uh, to your question about the, the boring company and the idea of having all of your vehicular traffic underground, basically, um, you know, there may be a role for some of those approaches when you're thinking about long distance travel. Um, but we have actually not been convinced that the idea of having your interface between the transportation system and the buildings be entirely underground is really good for the activity on the public realm. Um, and so we think those solutions are better suited towards medium or long distance uh, travel than the kind of scale that we are talking about here at Keyside, where you do really want that mixture of activity uh, to take place on the ground level in the outdoors. We think it's overall healthier and better for the community, for the activity of that public space. It's a question of prioritization and management. Uh, with regard to safety in uh, timber buildings, so we used a very experienced architect to help us with our proto models, uh, Michael Green Associates from Vancouver. And he also brought in his structural engineer, uh, Equilibrium, who is great because he's very familiar with seismic conditions, which are much more difficult than we have here in Toronto. So we got some really top uh, players there. And of course, all those designs will go through a peer review process. With regards to fire itself, um, Canada and many places have been testing CLT or these, these sandwiched wood pieces, and they have passed their fire tests. On top of it, they have design parameters where we have sprinkler systems, and I showed you one of the latest types of sprinkler systems that we would put in these buildings. They also encapsulate, meaning they cover up some of the surfaces with drywall. So they do actually have a, a whole design uh, for the six-story building now, parameters that you need to adhere to. When we look at the buildings above six stories or in the future above 12 stories, we will have to be following protocols to make sure that they're safe. But oddly enough, uh, it's not intuitive, but the polished wood surfaces do not catch on fire very easily at all. So if any of us split a log at home, we split it to open up the fiber so we, the log will actually burn. If you put a log in the fire that is not split, it doesn't burn very well at all. It actually just turns black. They get the same results in the fire test here in Canada, and I've seen the photography of it. It performs exactly the same way with the pieces that are manufactured here. Thanks. Um, our second last question here with Haban, and then we'll do our last question over here um, with Aaron. Oh, hi. hi. Further to the question about the wood, I was just wondering if, you, you, if there's glue involved in putting together the wood, the beams and everything, the pressed wood. Is there glue involved? Yeah, yes, there is uh, glue involved. These are adhesives. They are actually green adhesives. Uh, so they're sustainable. They, they are because they have a sustainable overall product, so they achieve that. Um, and they uh, adhere very, very well. They're actually pushed together to quite a high pressure to make sure they get total adhe adhesion between the members. Yeah. Well, I've just talked to some architect who said there was a question of toxic fumes. I don't know. She was, I was being happy. I was telling her about this wonderful in new development, and she... She said, oh yeah, but what about the toxicity? Yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, an issue. We have to have certified and tested products. But if you have a reference you want me to talk to an architect and give them some more information, that'd be fine. All right, Aaron, if we can have the last question. Oh, Haban's got it. I got one. Perfect. Hi, um, I was wondering at what stage in the project and at what capacity are you planning on bringing on architects for the design process? So we have some architects engaged uh, between Jesse and I already to really start forming the ideas. But uh, I don't want to make, have any mistake. These are not the architects that are going to finally design the buildings. That needs to follow a full public process, uh, just as anything would normally be. So we don't see that till after the master plan is actually approved and we're on our way. That's right. We still have, so we're building the plan now, and then we have a whole approval process, public engagement process, and then we would come back into execution. All right. So I think, Aaron, am I over to you? And you're going to tell people how to get to where they need to get to. And just to say, I know there are other questions, and we didn't maybe quite get to 20. Um, there will be people around after the roundtable section. You can come and talk to us individually for sure.
Great, and <clears throat> I also have to apologize because I, I meant to say 20 minutes for questions, and I think I said 20 questions, so I own that one. Um, but in any case, we are now at the part of the evening where we will be heading to the round tables. Um, you'll see there are a number here, and there are uh, quite a few open spaces on that side. Um, a few notes before we start moving. Um, we hope that everybody can join a round table at some point in the next uh, hour or so, I suppose. Um, but we acknowledge that there may not be seats for everybody right away. So what I would encourage you to do is find some people who aren't at roundtables, who might have blue shirts on, and speak with them. And as seats uh, come up at the tables, um, just drop in there and add your thoughts and contribute. Uh, we want to hear from everybody. We want to make sure that everybody has a chance to uh, contribute. Um, again, there are displays around the edge, so please take a chance to check them out. And if you can't stay any longer and you'd prefer to send questions over email, we're also happy to take that. So we will reconvene at 8.15 to report back from all of the roundtables.